Hi everyone, this is Pascal Henens, uh, and I'm joined with uh, Daniel Smith. And today, same as last time, we will have our threat researchers live. So hi, Daniel, how are you doing? And I will start by turning off the sound of my phone. You can see it's live, right? Yeah, Everything yeah, will yeah, go yeah. wrong again today. <laughs> so Thank hi, Daniel. Be... Hey, how's it going? Thank <laughs> you for reminding me to mute my phone too. I just had to do that. You doing all right today? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. Good, good. It's getting it's getting better in terms of Corona. People are getting out, so people are less frustrated. Yeah, over here in Colorado, we're uh, kind of le loosening up on our restrictions, so we can go out hiking and things like that. Uh, restaurants are still closed, but the impact. Yeah, is still well, re same here. Yeah, yeah, no, no food, but <laughs> still have to provide yourself with the food. But besides that, it's it's pretty much okay. Not that I go out a lot, but um, so yeah, for today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe it's better for the world that we stay inside, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the best things we do are done from behind the keyboard. So welcome everyone. So Threat Research is live. So we are live now, right now. So things can go wrong sometimes. Um, the idea is that we talk about what we saw last month. Uh, we did a session one month ago. Um, it's not too formal, as you can see, we, we like to talk to each other. Um, we are experimenting. Now, just a, a couple of things for you. There's a Q&A box somewhere on your screen. You should be able to find it. If, if you don't find it, you have the icons at the bottom. You click on Q&A. Don't hesitate to ask us questions. We will try to take as many questions live, even if the question well, it should be related to security in some some way, at least. But uh, we will try to answer pretty much any question that you throw at us. Um, for 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 today's call, what we wanted to talk about is uh, we we did recently an alert on hoax calls, and Daniel did a really big research on who are the people who made hoax calls and tried to connect dots between different malware. So the idea was not to go after the people, but actually to find out what is behind the campaign and what are bot herders doing? What are they doing to make such a big campaign? How do they start small? Do they, how do they evolve their botnet? How do they come to, to an actual service? So that, that will be later on. So I will be introducing some more basic stuff. I leave the complex stuff to Daniel later on, but I will do some basic introduction about what is a botnet and, and what is happening with botnet. So Daniel, anything you want to add at this time? Uh, no, no, I'm uh, actually uh, looking forward to having this conversation dialogue with some fresh research. So let's dive right into it. Yeah, great. So for the pe most people of you will know what a DDoS botnet is, but just to be sure that we have the, that we are talking about the same thing here. So a bot herder on the left side is the guy who sets up an infrastructure and that infrastructure will typically consist of what we call a command and control server. It's like an orchestrator that can orchestrate multiple of his malwares that are spread out in the world. And those malwares will be installed in the case of an IoT bot, it could be on an IoT device or router, it can be a setup box somewhere at, in, in a home, but can also be a cloud server like Daemonbot, for example, that was a, a very unsophisticated Qbot version that they just compiled for, for Linux and they just put it in the cloud. They were trying to, using an attack vector like how do PR to infect that server and start their, their bot on cloud servers. Needless to say, cloud servers are, are more, are better resources for, for, for creating DDoS attacks because of their bandwidth, they have direct access to the internet. So they have a much bigger bandwidth and much more processing power compared to a camera, which typically sits at home and has limited access. However, coming from a data center, it's easier to detect bots. And, and if you have a big white pipe and you're streaming a lot of traffic, it's easier to detect that attack and to actually block uh, that, that, that one stream that takes up most of uh, of, of the pipeline. However, if you have multiple cameras, it's much more efficient in terms of a lot smaller streams that are coming at you. And from a protection point of view, it's much more difficult to, to block them. So he has that command and control infrastructure that sits there also typically in that infrastructure. And it typically it can be the same server, but most of them do not use the same server. There's also a download server and the download server is the actual one that hosts the malware. And that is where 
what Daniel will also talk about during his, his explanation. I think uh, there, there is a good resource to find download servers. Um, it's uh, it's called URL House. Daniel, do you want to explain maybe about URL House? I think it's now is a good moment. Yeah, yeah. So um, at, at, at the current moment, I'm, I'm a big fan of URL House. Uh, one of the things that I like to do all day long is I sit around looking at our honeypots looking for binaries, downloading, and reverse engineering them, but I also submit them to URL house for the greater community. Um, this way, other researchers can search and find the different binaries that researchers like me and Pascal find. Um, and also at the same time, URL house has a great function where they um, submit complaints and abuse reports to these IP addresses that are known to be malicious hosts. Um, so in the long run, the, the beautiful thing about this is that we can actually work together to take down these hosts um, preventing the malware from spreading. And so what ends up happening is that you have these scanners out there. They're still scanning and attempting to exploit a device, but there is actually no payload to drop once they exploit the device. Um, therefore, it's somewhat uh, helping to prevent the DDoS attacks. Um, at the same time, it's also aggravating the attackers out there. So uh, you know that's something to be very aware of, that when you're going in and taking out a criminal C2 server, they're not just going to go away, they're going to come back. And so some of the things that we saw with Hoax Call over the last few months is that we saw multiple domains and multiple malware hosts used to host their payloads. But as soon as they were taken down, the scanners were still scanning for months after the takedown had happened and that they had moved on to a new domain and had no real control over what those scanners were doing. Um, so with that, I'll just hand that back to Pascal um, as far as yeah, the scanners and everything go. In the meantime, I was trying to get that. Oh, look, it's coming up, um, <laughs> but I don't have the answer. So yeah, that is not working. I, I was trying to get that URL house up live, but uh, clearly that wasn't the way that it should have worked. Sorry the, about the that. Demo, the demo gods were not in the favor today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for, for the people who are searching for the link on the URL house, ah, maybe, oh, hold on, I can send it to all, probably send to all webcast attendees. So hopefully now you all received the question about URL house where I answered with the URL. So there you can go to that link. And as Daniel said, he's submitting his URL because they do automated takedowns. Um, my bots, or better, my honeypots are also continuously getting attacked by botnets. And whenever I get a URL that's interesting, I also automatically submit it to URL house. So that, that is one of the things that, that we do. And typically the URLs that you see there, that is what is part of that download infrastructure from, 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 the, from the bot herder. So that infrastructure is the command and control. It communicates with the bots typically by, it can be a TCP socket like in the case of Mirai, but it can be also IRC, which was uh, typically the beginning of the, the bots and what is used by a QBot. Um, so IRC is the Internet Relay Chat. And so you know the chats, uh, the, the older chat programs. I don't know if, if, if anyone still, well, people are still using it, but not that popular anymore. They more been replaced by Slack and Team and other tools. Uh, but IRC is a really good forum uh, and, and with some specific topics, you can have your infected devices subscribe to that topic and then you can send it commands as the as the owner of that channel or, or that topic inside IRC. You just type in commands and then the bots will react to that command. So it's a cheap and easy, convenient way. You don't need to do write a lot of code, you just need your bot to connect to a known IRC server and IRC channel. And that's it, you have your interface as a herder. And then you have the more sophisticated ones that are using peer-to-peer -peer communications. Typically, they don't have a central server. Those are also the ones that are hard to take down because they, they're using something like a BitTorrent network where you have multiple peers all interconnected with each other and they can exchange information. So Hajime, for example, was, uh, was one of the first and, and better examples. Uh, it started in October 2016 and it's still around. So so proves the point that it's very hard to take it down because there, there, there's no central server. Typically when we take down a botnet, we would go after the central infrastructure, which is a command and control server. If you take that one out, well, the bots will still spread if they spread on their own, but they will starve out after after an amount of time. Now, typically that bot herder will use that botnet for something. So, so either it is to perform DDoS attacks and he can monetize it through ransom DDoS, or he can rent out his infrastructure to third parties. So he will have some kind of an API on top of the command and control server. And that API will be used by a booter and stressor service. So typically it will be like a portal. They have some 
most of the, the portals and booters and stressors use the same templates and the same portal tools, and they just change the API that communicates with their command and control server. And that way they can have anybody come into their, subscribe to their service and ask to run a couple of bots or to run the whole botnet against a victim and perform a DDoS attack. Now, one thing I'll so, jump in and say is, um, you know, with, as far as takedowns of the loaders go, um, when they're a centralized server, it's very easy. Um, you know, URL host sends out an abuse report to the cloud service. Uh, the cloud service checks, verifies, and removes the malicious hosts. Um, with bots like Hajime, like you said, they're, they're coming from residential routers. Um, so it becomes very difficult to be able to uh, send an abuse report to that residential home or ISP and have them actually reset the modem or anything like that. Um, because it's a residential and the communication is a lot harder. Now, another step well, the that- the FBI did it. <laughs> In <laughs> the case of VPN filter, they send out an alert. Hey, everybody, please reboot your modems. No? <laughs> that, that, yeah, 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 maybe we can get the FBI to say that. But, uh, you know, the, the, ne the next point I was going to is that, you know, bot herders are, are constantly thinking about ways to prevent researchers like Pascal and I. Uh, they're thinking about ways that prevent us from actually taking down their loaders. Um, so, you know, naturally the easiest way for them to have a loader is through a centralized server um, to, to prevent us from actually being able to take them down they'd go to like a residential service but some of the things that we're starting to see with some of the more loaders and uh, botnets that are going around it now um, they're using tor they're using the onion network for their loaders um, which makes it extremely difficult from our position now to take those loaders down because even though they're sitting on say a, a commercial cloud provider um, you still have to de-anonymize the network to figure out what the origin IP is to be able to send an abuse report and take them down. So it becomes very, very difficult um, to remove these loaders as the bot herder gains more skill. Yeah, and and I would I would add another kind of, of service that they're using. Re remember all the ATO attacks on RDP servers? What is very convenient is that you can go to the underground, you just buy some credentials for, for an RDP session, you go to the RDP server, you install your command and control. And your command and control could be running in a hacked server from, from an enterprise. And yeah, it's hard to take down an enterprise, right? Yeah. So yeah, if, 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 if they just rent out this, yeah. So if they just rent out the VPS service uh, in, in DigitalOcean or somewhere else, not say, uh, yeah, I'm not targeting digital ocean, by the way. Can be OVH, can be Amazon, uh, but uh, we see a lot of digital ocean though. <laughs> but you can go out and rent a VPS service over there. And with that VPS service, it's owned by him. So when, when there's an abuse call coming into digital ocean, digital ocean will look into it. They will see, okay, this guy is doing malicious traffic. So we will, we will bring him down. And However, that's another great thing about URL yeah. host too, is that they showed the takedown time. So you can actually look at the different yeah. hosting providers that are out there and understand how quick they respond to a takedown. So you can actually uh, allocate your resources to focus on the cloud service providers that do not move as fast. Yeah, that that is a great point. I like your URL house a lot for that because they have that automated takedown. And it even gives you in the statistics how many hosts you have taken down and what was the average time for takedown. And when you go into the detail records, you see the information about uh, who was, has been contacted. So yeah, I. I also really like that service. I like the little competition that we have going on right now, the manual versus automatic <laughs> submission. So uh, it's yeah, a very well, fun yeah. process. You can definitely <laughs> gamify research. That's the great thing about uh, our, our mm -hmm. industry here. Yeah, well, yeah, my, my honeypots are automatically submitting URL after URL whenever they find one. And if it's already known, it doesn't submit it. If it's unknown by your house, to, to submit it. But I can see in my statistics, the number of, of URLs submitted versus the number of takedowns is like, it's less than 50%. If you look at your statistics, okay, I'm gaining on you. Just after one month, I gained like a lifetime on Daniel by doing it automatically <laughs> by using machines. It's man versus machine. However, man versus machine, again, is not that accurate because Daniel's takedown ratio is like, it's like more than 95%. So every URL that he puts in, he has been working on it. That was one of the malwares that he discovered and that he worked on. And then he submits it to URL house. And of course it's live. So, and it's also a server that is still live that can be taken down. However, my honeypots, well, they see a malware being Try, somebody trying to infect me with a malware, I take the URL, automatically submit it to URL house. I don't even know if, 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 if the server is still active or not. And I see that like, 
in my post, there's still like 25% is Hajime. It's like the dot .i executable that comes out. So Hajime is, is, is very much there. So yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Oh, no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Ah. So I had a good bridge actually from Hajime to, to, to the distributed versus central scanning. Um, and you, you probably do remember Mirai and how the architecture of, of Mirai looks like. And I, I have a slide somewhere on it. But um, typically when you have a botnet, it will infect a camera. So don't, don't mind about the seeding. The seeding is how you start a botnet. Typically to start a botnet, you need to find at least one victim, you will infect it. And then that victim, once the bot is, is, is running, some of the bots like Mirai have their own scanning option. So that's what we call distributed scanning because every infected device in his turn becomes a scanner. Now it's just scanning, it's not infecting itself. So in the case of Mirai, it will scan the device. If it finds a Telnet port open and it finds a good credential to log into the camera, it will report that back to the loader server. And then the loader server will take that information, do the Telnet connection and infect the camera with the actual binary. So it's not the camera itself, it's not the bot itself that detected the vulnerable device that will infect it. It's actually the loader server. In the case of Hajime, it is the device itself. So a camera that is infected with Hajime, Hajime through its peer-to-peer -peer, exchanges the latest update of the bot binary and he will serve that bot binary. And actually it's much more complex than that. So the one that scans and finds the vulnerable camera will actually start the infection, but he will download it from another camera so he has a list of other colleague cameras in there with random ports and he will take another at random and will download it from there, making it much more difficult to take him down. But at the same time, as you can see, it's very noisy. There's many devices scanning and trying to, to, to get into the device. There's loader services coming in. So that is what we as a researcher like because they're very noisy. That means that we can easily map them out. We can exactly know how much devices are infected because they're all scanning us and they're all coming at us with the same commands. So honeypots are really effective to detect that. Now, opposite to distributed and, and examples, the typical examples of distributed are all the ones that are based on Mirai. So Reaper, IO Trooper, Satori, they, they're all coming off of, of Mirai. Uh, another example of a more central scanning, central means that you have a central server and you are scanning, hold on, I have a question. Uh, what exactly scanned in the scanning process? Yeah, when, when I say scanning, I mean searching for vulnerable devices. So scanning can be Telnet. So in the case of Mirai, what the scanner will do, he will scan for port open port 23, which is the Telnet port. If the port 23 is open, he will try to log in with the 61 default credentials that were in Mirai. So root and ABC123 or 123456 has a password, that is what the scanning does. And he does that randomly, he takes the IP range and he will do that randomly. So he will scan the whole internet through looking for active port 23. And when he finds an active port 23, we'll try to log in. That's what the and scanning just to does jump for- jump in real quick. Um, yeah. some, some, some of the other scanning processes they're looking for is exploits too. Uh, you know, when Mirai first came out, it was default credentials. Uh, and now today, when you look at hoax call, they ran through a dozen exploits for propagation last 60 days. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, so so in, in that case, that, that's a good remark. And in that case, they would be scanning for port 80 or port 5555, because that's like a web server that's running uh, typically for, for everything. That's a TR069 protocol, which is the management protocol used by provider to manage the modems. But it's using HTTP as a protocol, and inside HTTP is using XML. So there are some known exploits that have been used in TR069 to actually exploit the server. And most of the exploits that they're looking for are what we call RCEs, remote command execution. So what they're looking for is like encode one URL where you can put the shell code in to actually download a file from somewhere and then execute that file on the device. And you put that in one and the same URL. So it can be a get URL, can also be a post. And most of the vulnerabilities that we see are actually based on those HTTP headers, including the, the hoax calls. And also GenX used uh, some, some of those exploits. Now those exploits can be done 
by an infected device. So it can be so, but then you have to code actually the infection code inside the bot itself, or it can be done by a server, which is easier because the bot most of the time is written in C. It's C language. It must be low level, easy to install, not too big, not take too much resources. Um, you don't have a full Python environment or Perl or Ruby environment in most cameras. So don't expect the Python script to render. So it must be written and compiled, statically compiled, not with linked library, but statically compiled in C, which makes it less convenient to add new vulnerabilities or to code. Especially script kids, they, they like to copy pox that are online. So it's much more convenient if you can rent a server on the internet, you install Python, and then you copy paste the pox, and then you put it in a Python script. And then from that central location, you're just scanning the internet try to find open ports with HTTP or with Telnet and try to infect the devices that you discover from a central location. So the central location is much more flexible for, for the hacker because yeah, it's, it's just a script. He can easily update it. Uh, updating the full botnet, if you have like 1,000 bots already deployed in the wild, how are you going to update that? There's, there is no update mechanism even in Mirai. People just let it go and they, they start a new one if they want to do an update. They're not going to update themselves. So the central scanning is also a very important part. And that's typically done from central servers. And that's why I will know that the one strange yeah. thing is uh, the front on botnet where the, the procurement order actually requested Oday LLC in Russia to create a botnet, an IoT botnet based off Mirai that updated. Oh, yeah. So well, yeah, the, 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 it, yeah, there yeah. are people who are looking at that now. Well, the, 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 there are some good reasons for updating. And, and one I would think about is like uh, adding new attack vectors. So one is updating the scanning engine with new vulnerabilities so that they can find more more in, more devices to infect. The other one would be attack vectors, like adding new DDoS attack vectors or adding new features like proxies. And the more complex one, like VPN filter, for example, was a modular one. He can he has multiple phases in downloading, uh, just like, like the Windows malware does. And that one is more modular and can update itself. Hajime can also update in itself. Uh, Hajime is actually one of, I. I like Hajime a lot because technically it's it's very sophisticated and it has some really nice nice things that are in there. Especially the peer to peer, the way that that it's downloading malware, that it's finding colleagues in that peer to peer network to download those malwares, um, the way that it updates itself, its configuration. Um, we still don't know who's behind it, if it's a bad or a good guy, because it doesn't come with any malicious payload to attack, but still. So an, an example of that central scan was GenX. So G GenX was just a Qbot, and they use central servers to scan. Of course, much more difficult to detect, because in our honeypots, in, in my honeypot, the only thing that I saw was one server that was scanning. So if you compare that, if you have, at that time, you had Mirai botnets that were 50 to 100,000 devices. Try to imagine 100 devices all at the same time, scanning the whole internet, trying to break into vulnerable devices. That is very easy to catch. If you have only one server and it's scanning the whole IP range in 24 hour, and so one event per day you will see in your honeypot. For the other one, you see 100,000 events per day. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's, just to it's jump easy in there, to lose it in all like, the noise. Yeah, I probably see six to maybe like a half dozen to a dozen attempts from the hoax call ecstasy campaign every day in my honeypot. So, you know, yeah, just to just to put a number on the the noisiness and what you described, mm -hmm. it's it can get pretty loud out there. Yeah, well, and the, the typical Mirai, it's, it's, you're talking the thousands of, 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 of hits if they have multiple servers, because they can have multiple servers that are exploiting as well. So, so even the central scanning doesn't mean they have one server. They can set up like 20 servers, and then they, those 20 servers will scan. And some, they even split up the ranges. So, so the newer bots that, that you see distributed scanning, some of the bots are downloading an IP range and using that IP range for scanning. So that they're not scanning the full internet, but for example, the Brazil bot will only scan the Brazil area, which makes for less noisy. It's not crossing any borders, so it stays local. So it's actually some some of them are are getting better at that. And another one, which is Brickerbot, and you know Brickerbot has always been close to my heart. <laughs> but Brickerbot is not scanning. Brickerbot was what we call a sentinel. And until now, that's like the only one that we found that works that way. And actually the reason that it works that way is because it's trying to 
be a vaccination against malware or better a defense against malware than, than it is about infecting. The idea of the Sentinel is that you have an infected router somewhere on the internet and that router is just listening. It's listening for what? Well, for telnet scans and it's listening for, for HTTP vulnerabilities that are trying to be exploited. And whenever it sees something come in, it will take the source port and it will counter attack it. So actually it's like a honeypot that is detecting intrusions and based on those intrusions, he's counter-attacking the device and tries to destroy it. So in the case of Brickerbot, he was trying to destroy IoT devices to actually get rid of all the problems that IoT was causing on the internet. Now, he didn't get that far because the IoT is still here and is still causing lots of damage. A good attempt, though. <laughs> but yeah, I guess yeah, you call him great, but... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was quite smart because the, the janitor, so... so the alias that one of the aliases that he used and the one that he was most public with he even came out public but nobody was ever able to find him yeah. so so in the case of, of mira so this is the architecture of mira yeah of course you cannot see my mouse <laughs> i'm pointing with my mouse but that would not work for you sorry about that so so mira you have the bots at the bottom so you see there's a gray bot and that gray bot once it is infected it will receive a command from the server to start scanning that can be receiving from the server can start automatically depends on on how you change the source code of Mirai. So that bot will start doing telnet port scans. And when it finds a telnet port scan, like on the blue new Vic bot there, or that's more or less, it's an, let's say it's an IP camera, that blue one. So when it finds a new Vic through the telnet port scan, it will try to do the brute force login. So it has 61 factory default passwords, usernames and passwords. Now it can do the same. So this is the example for telnet, but it does the same with HTTP exploits and with all kinds of exploits. As long as there's an exploit, they're able to, to build it in. Now he's doing the scan. He's not doing the infection. The actual infection happens afterwards. So once the bot finds a new victim, he will take the IP address, take the credentials that were successful, and he will report it back to a scan and listen service that runs on the infrastructure. The scan and listen service will make sure that the victim was not previously found by another bot, because remember, hundreds of thousands of bots are scanning at the same time. There's some collisions happening there. You don't want to reinfect yourself again or try to avoid that. So whenever there's a new victim from the scan and listen service, he will pass it to the loader service and the loader service will telnet into that bot because he knows the username and password to get into it. And he will actually download the malware and execute the malware. The malware is just executing live in memory. So that means whenever you reboot that device, the router or the camera, the bot will be gone. But it's just a matter of time because one of the 100,000 will come by again and scan you and you will be reinfected. So that's why we see a lot happening. So after Mirai, Mirai was one of the bigger bots. After the Mirai era, we saw smaller botnets that were not 100, 500, 400, 500,000, like, like what was the case with, uh, with, with some of the attacks that, that we saw by, who, who was the guy again who was picked up in uh, the, the airport in, in the UK? Um, Daniel, Daniel K. Yeah, not Daniel Yo, Smith, yeah, by yeah, the way. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel K. Yeah, I see fine. Daniel blushing. He's already he he was scared. Yeah, he was scared for a moment there. <laughs> <laughs> so Daniel K was was one of those hackers. He had a four hundred thousand bot botnet at some point, um, but after the Mirai era, as more people were getting into that bot and took the source code from Mirai and compiled their own bots, there was more activity and there was more fighting. There was more competition to build botnets. So that means whenever there is a device that is available, the bot will try to infect it. Once it's infected, other bots will try to come in. But the first things that Mirai does is like turn off Telnet, turn off all the services that he knows is vulnerable. Um, and when he executes, he will search for existing bots. So there's a bot killer function inside Mirai that will look for existing bots and try to kill those bots off. So it's trying to take over the device and trying to protect that device. Now, when the device is rebooted, it becomes available. Then there's another one coming in and probably will be another bot that infects it. So you see there's lots of fragmentation going on. The more people are trying to build their botnets, the more fragmentation there are there is. And, and also the more... Uh, the smaller the bots are getting. We get more botnets, but they're smaller, so their impact in the attacks is, is, is smaller. 
So once a bot executes, it will register with the command and control server, and tip that also uses port 23 in the case of, uh, of, of, of Mirai, and then we'll get commands from the command and control server. Um, hold on, there's a question. Are botnets able to do self-destruction? Uh, yeah, there, yeah, actually there, there are. So VPN filter, for example, had a self-destruction mechanism. There was a command in there for, to, to eradicate. And actually what bots are doing, so like Mirai, when Mirai, so you download Mirai, you download into a temporary folder, then Mirai gets executed. The first thing that Mirai does is an unlink kernel call. So unlink is, is the call that's the same like an RM. It's like remove on the command line. So you know that that in, in Unix, you can run your process, you can remove the file, and even that the file is removed, that just means that the, the directory entry is removed, but the inode still exists, and all the data blocks are still allocated as long as the executable is running. Once the executable stops running, all the allocated blocks will go to the deallocated pool and to the free pool, and they can be used again for new files. But as long as it's running, you can, so you, on Unix, you can start any binary and remove the binary. Now the binary file will still be somewhere allocated in blocks on your disk, but there will be no table entry in the directory listing, so you will not find it anymore by using ls or any other file commands. It's just running in memory. So when you reboot, your device comes back and you look for the executable, there is no executable because it was deleted. And there are actually some, some self-destruction ones that you can send the command and all they need to do is exit and they're gone. So, so you, you have no proof or what, so no forensic information that is left over that that was running. And actually Mirai, one of the bot killer features of Mirai is using that. So Mirai, for example, has a bot killer routine that is scanning for processes in memory and tries to find those processes that have a f an executable file that has no real file name backed in the file system. So that means he's searching for executable that actually removed their file. And when he finds one, he kills that process because he believes that this is a competing bot. So they're, they're actually, they're, Pretty clever. There's a lot of things to learn in uh, in, in Mirai, actually. And the second question is how to track how many bot net, botnets are present in a network. Um, you know, just kind of a general way to estimate that is uh, when we're looking at the honeypots as far as centralized server and how many people are scanning our honeypot itself will give us an idea of generally how many bots are inside of that network. Yeah, it's if if it's distributed scanning, you can just count how many of them are trying to infect you, and then you 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 can make up a map of of where the different infected ones are. Now, in some cases, you you can also like like me, right? The command and control communication is so obvious and so easy. You can also break into the command and control, and once you are into the command and control channel, there are sometimes commands that allow you to list out the bots. And another way is to go to the website of the attacker, and if you're lucky, he didn't put in a password, or yeah, their, their, their OPSEC is sometimes a little bit messy, so they, they might be using a default password. So you can get access to their platform, and then you can see actually in their console. So they in their console, they have a command to ask, list me all the bots, or give me the number of bots. Uh, so, so then you can know exactly how many bots are in there. But typically, we will use, like in the case of Mirai, we, we use the number of ones that are trying to infect us, and then that gives us a good approximation of where are the countries that are most infected and who is mostly infecting uh, uh, others. So that those are the maps that you see. So typically, when you have like a screenshot of a map and you have those circles in blue or in red or whatever, where they show that's the biggest infected area or the most bots were infected there, typically, that's based on the scanning. So that's also the trick that we're using. Any other questions? So we had to scan. OK. Yeah, I see that some people have problems with audio and video streams. I hope for most of you it's OK. Let me see if I'm not talking to nobody. Oh, no, 49 people online. OK, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's good, actually. Thank you for joining us, by the way. I did not tell it yet. <laughs> Now, another thing that bots and, and maybe Daniel, you can talk about the maybe the evolution, all the different payloads that we see. So uh, we, we talked about until now for the bot, we talked about <coughs> vulnerabilities that it's abusing to infect other devices. 
Yeah, we call that the infection vector. But uh, there's also another part of the botnet that's very important, especially to us uh, as, as a company, as, as Redware, that is what the malicious payload is. And Daniel, you want to take us through it? Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess we'll just kind of bridge right over into hoax call. Um, so yeah. so <clears throat> just to kind of give you a general background, um, we, we run these massive networks of honeypots, and we're constantly monitoring them every day. Um, and in our reports, we start seeing uh, some very interesting user agents show up, um, specifically ecstasy, ecstasy botnet, Polaris, Polaris botnet, um, and, and a few others. The, the, the thing that kind of caught our attention um, was not the attack vectors, um, and it wasn't the botnet and source code itself. It was the propagation method that came inside the malicious payload. Um, that, that the malicious payload was delivered through. Uh, so, so you know, at first when hoax call was going around, it was not actually using uh, propagation payloads like that we're seeing today. It was just using standard brute force uh, attack vectors. It was probably around, I would say January, February, um, that the attackers began exploring propagation methods using exploits. Um, and what we ended up starting to see is we saw an explosion of activity with similar strings. Um, and so we, we start monitoring this situation. We start looking at, hey, we possibly have this ecstasy campaign. We possibly have this players campaign. And, and we start digging around inside. And one of the things that was really interesting was how they deployed payloads with different attack vectors in them. So one sample they release might just have VSC in it. Um, another sample they released might just have DNS, HEX, and UDP. And then one of the samples that we found had 19 attack vectors in it. So they were definitely going through and they were playing with their payload and playing um, with, with their samples and, and, and the code itself. What it had ended up happening is that they played with a Mirai, Cubot, Tsunami, um, Bashlight type of variants, uh, copy pasting from everything, and that's where they ended up getting the hoax call family uh, botnets. So hoax call really isn't anything too special specifically. It's just a copy paste variant of Mirai, Tsunami, and Bashlight. Um, what became so really interesting, Daniel, the the, the command yeah. and control channel was IRC, right? Yes, yes, and that was another thing. It was an IRC, which is is kind of an old technique there. Um, Typical for for Qbot, by the way, yeah. And tsunami, yes, exactly. Um, and, and and so what we ended up seeing is that we saw this attacker start going through a number of exploits. Um, and as I said, it got to a dozen over 60 days, which was very, very impressive. Um, and the author was not specifically creating these exploits. Um, it was just simply going out and finding these vulnerabilities and making them work uh, for their botnet itself. One of the things that we decided to do is we, we, we didn't want to go into complete attribution, um, but we wanted to start looking at who or the group that might be behind this campaign. Um, so several strings point us to uh, VBR, XMR, AKA Vector, um, has a couple other handles goes by. Um, it, it, was, it was interesting to see how this specific author wanted the attention. Um, and that's not so uncommon with skids today. Um, they, they definitely want attention. They want people to write about them. We try to avoid that. But the reason why we, we wrote about this specific uh, um, botnet was because of the propagation method, because of the payload. Yeah. Um, so, so, so the, what, what actually triggered you? Uh, it, it was the ecstasy that you find in the agent headers of the attackers, or the, the specific names. Because I, I remember we have been looking in different honeypots uh, of us trying to find that ecstasy, and it came back in different attack methods. Like Hadoop Yarn was one of them. The other one was a Talnet, and then there was an HTTP that was also very popular that was being abused. So that that name came up a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it definitely came up a couple times. Uh, we saw it at the end of our report as well, um, being associated with Elite Hoser um, campaign, uh, which uh, uh, NetLab 360 had lightly attributed to Mubot. Um, we really didn't want to dive too deep into that attribution uh, because it is common for um, threat actors out there to use each other's strings to try and create false attribution. So kind of at that point, we decided to walk away from attributing to the actual attackers and continue focusing on the botnet itself. Um, even just yesterday, there was a brand new domain that was put up, a brand new malware loader, and it was scanning around. I think it's actually already down within 12 hours. 
Um, but but the campaign has gone through several loaders. So that was one of the things that we were looking at through our research process is that um, at one point in time, their loader was called irc.hoaxcall.pw. Um, but there is another loader previously that was called vbrxmr.pw. Um, so once again, we're seeing the author reuse these strings, not only in their malicious loader in their C2, um, but also throughout their, their code itself with some interesting comments. Um, so, so, so one, one of the things that, that you saw was that, uh, he was using, or so some of the bots were using ecstasy and, uh, agent header. That's not something that we typically see, right? No, it's really not. The user agent header was is very different, but I can tell you over the last few months, it's become a very typical thing. So we have DVR bot, we have XSC bot, we have Polaris bot. There, what, there's a number why of would you do that? Because it's giving away immediately that you're something malicious, right? Uh, no browser will identify itself as being ecstasy. Right. You know, it kind of comes down to the marketing and campaigning of criminals. Um, if, if you're building up a stress of service, if you're building up a botnet service, you're going to want people to know who you are. And you're also going to want to prove um, how large of a network you have. The only way mm -hmm. that you're going to get that proof is by attributing yourself to that botnet and allowing people to say, oh, that's part of the XSC campaign. But as I said, the problem that we're having after the report is that other people can actually now take these strings and incorporate them into their own botnet uh, to cause misattribution. So at, at one point in time, it was a very fun part of tracing the botnet. Now we actually have to dive into the source code, look at the actual techniques that they're using, look at the code itself to, to properly attribute it to the same campaign. Reverse the binary, you mean, we, because we don't yes. have the source code, right? Ju just to make it clear, we don't have the source code, <laughs> <laughs> which would be bad for yeah. us if we would, I think. <laughs> yeah, definitely do not have a source code there. But some of the interesting things around the whole vector campaign was just kind of showing that they had skill. Um, of course, that up until February, it didn't look like they had a lot of skill. They were very noisy. But then they went through 12 different exploits of propagation. Um, they did have a couple of slip ups when it comes down to OPSEC as far as putting information into those strings that led us back to uh, say YouTube video that was advertising a stressor service that inside you could actually see the ecstasy strings in the IRC channel and you could also see the hell room IRC channel as well labeled there. Um, so we're not exactly dealing with the best and the brightest, but we are dealing with the most motivated uh, due to financial causes, reasons. Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm asking a follow-up question because I had one question that um, is not 100% clear to me. So I'm asking for follow-up. Sorry about that. No problem. <clears throat> so yeah, so, ecstasy yeah. puller is... Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was another thing is that we also had uh, uh, using some of the information that we found inside the, the, the botnet code. Um, took us to like the, the null.to form where there is a user that was selling uh, source code for an attack or for, for a botnet. Now we don't know hundred percent if it is actually ecstasy because we're not legally allowed to purchase these things from criminals. Um, but we can say within some medium accuracy that this threat actor was using the same uh, name, was using the same emails, using the same jabber and advertising services that, we were seeing inside the source, uh, inside the botnet. So uh, certain attack vectors, we were seeing black nurse, we were seeing DNS, we were seeing e uh, hex. Um, so, so there were some dots that we could connect and saying this is likely um, vector that is selling the source code now. And, and the interesting thing is that he actually advertised that source code the day after Unit 42 put out their report about mm. um, hoax call. So the so source code is out there actually. Yes, it is. Uh, well, you know, if you can find the guy and if you can for... buy it from them. Yeah, yeah and that's the thing. Is it's not that difficult to go out there and find different source codes. I think like Mubot had leaked. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, Mirai's out there, Tsunami, all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah. if, if you look hard, you can find it. Yeah, in the case of Mirai, it's not even that hard. <laughs> There's so many. It has been forked so many times on, on GitHub. It's so, so easy to find. Um, it doesn't mean it's all working, but... Uh... It's it's still fairly easy to to set up. So so yeah, nineteen DDoS attack vectors. So that is actually quite amazing. And uh, but so some of them. So the typical ones are there: the UDP attack vectors. You also said Black Nurse, which is something that we yeah, don't yeah. So, see that 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 often. Uh, that the, is actually. You know, the, 
I would say that that uh, I'm, little, I'm looking at the list right now. Black Nurse um, was definitely one of the weirder ones to see there because you don't see it so often inside the source code or inside the botnets. Um, URG was another uh, interesting one to see thrown around. Hex was another interesting thing to see thrown around. Typically <laughs> inside of these botnets, what you're seeing is you're seeing like DNS, you're seeing UDP, you're seeing uh, all the little TCP attacks, and you're also seeing layer seven as far as the HTTP attacks go as well. Um, but to see 19 attack vectors inside of one sample, um, to me yeah. shows that they are building a bot for the purpose of financial gain to launch attacks for the DDoS for yeah. hire industry. Now, so, some of the vectors were HTTP, right? It was so, to be clear, some, some of those bots come with UDP attack vectors and what that is, generally they, they create a raw packet where they can put in the source IP and destination IP. So they, they build it themselves, use a raw packet, send out the packet and like flooding packets, sending multiple packets out. That's typically what UDP does. Now they also typically come with HTTP attack vectors, but HTTP is a little bit different. And HTTP, they make like, it's, it's, it's not that smart. They make like a loop and all they do is make a connection with HTTP or HTTPS. So you might think, why would that impact my environment if just this bot comes in and then he starts doing an HTTP, HTTP connection and he's using, because the, the, the newer bots are using like random user agent strings copied from real user agent strings. So, so that makes it much more difficult to make the difference between a real browser making a connection and a bot making a connection. Yeah, and my lights are turning off here, so it's getting darker. <laughs> <laughs> they try to tell us our time's up or something. <laughs> yeah, pro probably. My battery's done on my light, so <laughs> no, I still need to put them in. Uh, I, I still waiting for some stuff to 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 make my streamer office professional quality, you know, <laughs> as I'm going <laughs> and as I'm moving forward in the world of streaming. Uh, so so I was saying, yeah. So th those HTTP connections. So what they do is imagine thousands and thousands of bots each of them in a tight loop just doing http connections to your web server that's a lot of http connection that's how you make an http connection flood now let them all do ssl and it becomes much worse for your server because the processing time on the server side is 18 times the processing time on the client side for 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 handling that ssl connection so that's how those bots can can actually by taking multiple devices and, and by, by being big numbers, they can actually make attacks fairly complex to detect and block because they all use random user agents. So, so you cannot use the user agent to filter them out. They all look like legitimate connections because they looked at your website and they saw some file that is open to the internet. So they're just requesting that file over and over and over again. So it becomes much more difficult to to block them and attribute them. And even though for them, it's very easy to write, it's just a loop. And all the loop does is doing an HTTP connection to that URL and taking a random user agent or the same user agent, but randomly choosing it and keeping the same one for one hour. Because otherwise, if the IP and the user agent is changing all the time, that's one way for us to detect that it's a bot trying to attack. If he keeps it for, for, for 24 hours, but he changes it randomly across all the different bots that he has in his botnet then he can perform actually an attack that is much more harder to to detect so it looks like fairly simple when you look at the source codes on, on how they construct those attacks but being in such a big numbers it makes it fairly difficult to 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 detect them and to block them it's pretty effective daniel uh, so we have one more question the date um i'm yeah, you you have some something to say why I try to decode the question. I have one more question that I want to to answer that I had a follow up question, but trying to understand what it is. It isn't. Oh, so so if you use tunnel, well, yeah. So so most of the bots that are on those devices are not in it to find information although there are some that have been used in that so vpn filter for example again so that is probably my favorite example because it's one of the more sophisticated and supposedly by a nation nation state um supposedly allegedly so i did not attribute it um but you <laughs> yeah exactly but you can find it vpn filter search it online yeah you will see it's pretty sophisticated and one of the things was it had a proxy so it can proxy traffic from a user going in and out um 
another interesting thing is yeah so so the the way it survives so vpn filter and i i think we need to do a session on vpn filter because it had so so many interesting things from 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 a bot specifically um because vpn filter had that way of being of contacting the command and control server so Mirai, most of the Mirais, they have the IP address of the command and control server in the binary. It's not in clear text. There is an IP. When you do the strings on the binary, you will see an IP address. And that IP address is just fake. It's a, it's a static defined in the code that says fake IP. And that is not the command and control server. The real IP is in a table that is encrypted. So once you have the encryption key, which is a simple XOR, and the key is fairly easy to find. So you take that key, you XOR the, the, the table with, with settings, and then you will find the IP address of the command and control. It's hard coded inside the bot. In the case of VPN filter, the command and control was actually in the metadata of a picture that was on photobucket i believe photobucket.com there was a, a specific picture there and in the geo coordinates so in the geographic coordinates was encoded the ip address now the photo was removed and once the photo was removed of course it had no command and control anymore so it could not reach the command and control anymore so it had some backup mechanism and one backup mechanism that i remember was actually fairly impressive that was that it was listening to all the packets and it was listening for a secret knock, a port knock. You know port knocking? Some, some devices allow you to port knock and port knock is like encoding. You know, when you do on the door, like Well, if you do that on a port, it can open the port and let your IP address in. So actually they had some port knocking technique. So their bot was continuously listening to the packet streams. And when it saw an ICMP address with certain bytes encoded in specific offsets, then it knew that this was one of the operators trying to get in touch and the IP address would be after those bytes and it can take that ip address from that icmp packet and or, or tcp sin packet sorry can take that ip address and then use that as a command as a new command and control so even when all the command and controls are taken offline as long as the operator saved a list of all the infected devices and they send the sin packet to all those devices with the updated ip they can redirect their bots back to another command and control do the update and can start all over again so it's actually pretty clever now that is not encapsulated but i i hope that answers a little bit but a bot is not really there to look into vpn data if, if your data goes through vpn through your router well yeah it's not they they will not decapsulate that data it's not they we've seen some proxies and proxies were used either to sniff um uh, so so one of them was to sniff traffic coming from inside going to the outside especially basic authentication they were sniffing even https what they were doing they were redirecting https to http for the for for, for the user because yeah you're, they're on the modem so they are on the gateway they can do pretty much whatever they want but not a lot are doing that what you see much more in terms of proxy is for example a bot using a proxy server to have outside connections proxy to somewhere else and that is used to create anonymous networks imagine you have 100,000 ip cameras that you infected with your bot put the sock server or proxy server on that and you can sell it as a service to somebody who's doing automated bad bot attacks to websites and typically when you have an automated bad bot that will be a script that does scraping for example and you will host it in amazon or or in another cloud well one of the first things that our bot manager does when a connection comes in is checking where is it coming from and if it's from a data center well we already know something is off here typically a user does not sit in a data center a user sits at home in the isp ranges not in an as number that is associated with a cloud hoster so how can you hide? Well, you just rent the service from one of those bot herders who has many bots. And remember, what are those bots infecting? IP cameras and modems in residential lines. So you actually have proxy service in a residential line. So you can proxy your bad bot scraping traffic across a proxy that sits in a modem in somebody that was infected in a residential place. So you can attack different websites and it looks like it's legitimate users who are sitting at home who are trying to get access to data on the website. Much more difficult, again, to take down. And if you have thousands of them, well, you can distribute that traffic, that malicious traffic. 
so they use it for malicious traffic uh, handling. So it's like anonymous VPN services that you can also rent. You can also rent anonymous VPN service like private VPN and Nord VPN. Uh, those use servers and data centers still, but you, you could also do it by using illegal IP cameras and routers and just build proxies on that. And you don't even need proxies. UPnP is a convenient protocol. So with UPnP, exposed to the outside and their actual modems who expose UPnP on the outside. So with a simple HTTP and an XML encoded UPnP request, you can actually set up port forwarding as such that a, a packet coming from a server that comes in on port X on the router is redirected to another IP in a public server port Y. So you can actually do port forwarding configurations through UPnP that are forwarding between different modems and that way you can make Make like the CSI, you know, the map where, where this, this guy is hiding between all the routers and you see them ping-ponging from one router to another. You can do that remotely. All you need is a small server that talks UPnP that has a list of, of devices that are exposing UPnP. So you go to Shodan, ask for UPnP ports, and that's it. You just run your script, you set up the tunnel, you send your packet to the first device and it will automatically forward and make its way through the internet until the victim. And to take it down, well, you just do the reverse of the script. You take down all the UPnP rules and you're gone. Nobody sees, there's no infection, you're invisible. There was actually a whole campaign based on that that was going on. Hundreds of thousands of Muslims being abused by that. Uh, I don't remember the name. Uh, Symantec discovered it somewhere. It's, it was a pretty long running campaign, actually. So, um, so let's run it up. Question. Sorry, I. I I'm just talking, talking, uh, <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> no, it's, all, it's all good. We have one last question here. Um, can you address IoT attacks in the consumer space versus industrial IoT? You want to take that one too, Pascal? Um, yeah, so so <laughs> one would think that industrial IoT is better secured, but it, it is not. And uh, industrial IoT, I, I'm not sure if you're talking about OT operational, so the the, the industrial IoT, let's say that we also talk about all the critical infrastructures and so on. Um, so industrial IoT can be heating systems and, and heating systems, they're, they're not better secured than a camera or modem in a consumer or, or IoT space. Uh, but typically those are more complex systems but still it's happening and the protocols that we see there and that we have seen being impacted is like protocols like MQTT and Modbus Modbus is one of those protocols used by those industrial IoT devices to communicate between each other. Well, it's easy to scan for Modbus devices and also MQTT devices. And actually there, there were some examples on the internet where people scanned for MQTT and through the MQTT, they saw that they had access to some configuration for electricity switches. And then to the same server, they could go with HTTP and they had access to a portal without authentication, by the way, access to a full portal that could on and off switches from 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 water purification stuff i, I don't exactly know which one it was or what it was but uh and that that is the scary part because people sometimes think an ip address is like a password and maybe it used to be but with showdown and uh who are the other ones census, census. Uh, zoom i yeah so with those guys continuously scanning the internet your IP address is not security by obscurity anymore. Your IP address is well known. I go to Shodan, I put in MQTT protocol, I get a list of all the servers. I can even subscribe to a service from Shodan that will tell me in real time, whenever there's a new MQTT server coming up, it will tell me. I will get the IP address and I can go ahead and try to hack it or infect it. So, so that, there's no such thing. And unfortunately, a lot of industrial IoT, the smaller ones, I mean, I'm not talking about the nuclear plants. Nuclear plants are a little bit more difficult, not impossible though, but uh, more difficult to, to get into, typically social engineering, fishing, USB sticks in the parking lot, things like that. But uh, smaller ones like a, a very remote, so a, a remote water purification system where the guy, does not come in every five minutes, sometimes they just put it out with an IP address open on the internet and it's just a matter of finding the right IP address and right protocol and you're in even without authentication. And it, there's multiple examples of that. Now in the IoT space for the consumer, it's more about modems. So the IoT in the consumer is more about mass infection so if you have like a Zixel modem, Zixel modem is popular for this ISP or for this kind of region. So typically they have 
hundreds of thousands of those modems deployed. Nobody is updating the firmware. So whenever there's a Zixol vulnerability coming out, you see all the botnets trying to infect those modems. Those are the consumer IoT. Industrial IoT is not about infecting those devices, more about finding protocols. And then you have some white hats and some gray hats and some black hats also that are trying to play with that system or that try to, to, to expose it for, for, for some pain. So, but it's typically not the infection and you will typically not find the same, it's, it's not as widespread vulnerability that's out there. It's just a bad way of configuration and, and securing. But there's certainly a lot of examples in industrial IoT, but home IoT would be the set top boxes. So the ADB, for example, Android debug bridge. If you enable Android debug bridge on your set top box and, and it's using UPnP to expose itself, well, port 5555 and you can use a small tool connect and uh, yeah so maybe one last question because I have a call coming up and we're on the top of the hour so we have one last question how to find out if a Zixel router is infected well um, it's it may be harder to find out if it's infected but you can go you, you can go onto the CLI of your router and you can try to, to look for processes with strange process names or you just look in the source code of Mirai, and that's my favorite way. You look in the source code of Mirai, and he has a way to detect those processes that don't have a backing file. Or you use LSOF to find ports that it's listening to, because typically those, the, what the what Mirai does, for example, it kills Telnet D and then listens on Telnet itself. Why? Because killing Telnet D one blocks any other bot from getting access and infect that same device through Telnet because the Telnet daemon is gone. Now, if you kill Telnet D, there's a watchdog somewhere who will start Telnet D again. So that's like a game that you need to continue to do. You kill it, somebody starts it up. You kill it, he starts it up. So what does Mirai do? It kills Telnet D and then opens a socket on port 23 and does nothing with that socket. It's not even listening on that socket. It just allocates it so that next time when the watchdog is starting Telnet D, it will fail because it cannot allocate the port. Only one process can allocate a port on Unix. So that's what Mirai does. So use LSOS, list, list open files, search for Telnet or, and find the, or use Netstat, Netstat, and you can see port 23 which process is owning port 23. If it's your Telnet D, well, that's already, yeah, you may be lost. But if it's another process, ah, you might have detected the bot. Now to clean it is much more easy. You pull it out of the power, put it back in. But it's only a matter of time before you're reinfected. So maybe we will end on that note. Daniel, any closing remarks? Uh, no, I just can't wait to the next one that we do. Um, I think we have a lot of ideas of what we could get into. Yeah, I'm having fun. I hope our, yeah, the people that good. are joining us find it interesting and having fun as well. Uh, so we will we'll end off here for this week. Um, and yeah, we will be back next month, most probably, uh, or earlier. So watch out for the next invitation. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, have a good day and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.